I'm Mike Lyons, your host for another oral history for the Jacksonville Broadcasters Association. The association's purpose is to preserve the rich history and heritage and contributions of the area's radio, television, and broadcasting industry. The association is open to those past and present broadcasters and those affiliated with the region's broadcasting industry and entities who have served the region's proud broadcasting heritage. We welcome students who are focusing their careers on the broadcasting industry. Our guest today is John Harrell, who worked, John worked 12 years in radio broadcasting in Jacksonville. He's been a longtime board member of the Jacksonville Broadcasters Association. He is a self-described media geek, and I would certainly second that. John, thanks for joining us today here on this oral history. Thanks for being with us. Mike, it's a pleasure and a privilege. Um, this is a first in the Broadcasters Association history because in this interview, is on, it is on Zoom today. Um, John is, in fact, is in Tampa, Florida. I'm in Jacksonville. John does hasn't moved to Tampa, but he's been working out of Tampa for a while. As we take this in May of 2020, uh, we have been in a two-month lockdown thanks to the coronavirus and COVID-19. We are starting to open up some activities at, at this time. Uh, that have been off the limits. We usually do these interviews at a small studio at the University of North Florida under the supervision of UNF Professor Ken Thomas, who is a board member of the association. But UNF is closed right now. And Ken has worked hard to put this together to do a Zoom oral history, uh, virtual, bigger than ever in 2020, certainly. John, many know you as the media representative for the Florida Department of Children and Families. Uh, we see you on TV, hear you on the radio, but what's it been like for you for the last two months having to do your work from home for, for so many weeks? Great question, Mike. It's been surreal. I'll tell you what, it's amazing how quickly everything shut down because, you know, we were hearing inklings of all this. I mean, you started to hear about, okay, this mysterious virus that's over in Asia. And then there's, you know, thoughts about, is it going to get over here? And that's January. And then, you know, I think beginning in like sometime in February, I began to hear about like a few cases in the U.S. It's like, OK, I don't know. You know, where is this going? And then it gets to the point where all of a sudden in March, you're hearing about more cases. I'm thankful that I scheduled a haircut and an oil change in the same night. You know, literally, I think uh, early March, because I'm thinking to myself, I don't know how much longer all these places are going to be open. Now, I had no idea, though, that it was going to get to this point. I remember well, as you do. Players Championship, boom, first day, everything's going okay, but while the tournament's going on, comes the word, no more crowds. And then before the second round, boom, whole tournaments canceled for the year. Then you had the NBA, you know, happening around the same time. I think that was a big wake-up call for folks. And then finally, right around St. Patrick's Day, uh, everything just switched off. Yeah, so here we are. Now, we're, we're going to turn now to broadcasting, because that's why we have you on for this oral history. Um, uh, you, l let's um, talk about, you told me a story from your kindergarten days that kind of yeah. indicated your interest in broadcasting at that early age. Kind of relate that story to us. Yeah, Mike, it's something where I actually was able to read at a fairly young age. And many uh, students at Assumption Catholic School, late 1970s, they were still kind of getting the reading thing, you know, they were skeptical. It's like, you can already read, John, going into kindergarten? So they had to go to the principal's office and said, okay, read this newspaper out loud. And I remember taking the newspaper and insisting on reading the television listings out loud. <laughs> like, that sounds account. like you, my man. <laughs> yeah, Channel 4 Midday, Channel 12, Days of Our Lives. I mean, I was far gone by that point. I mean, it was like, you know, destiny. I was just going to go into broadcasting in some way. <laughs> You went, you went to Bishop Kenny. You were class of uh, 91. Yeah. What, what did you do uh, at that point after you got out of high school to get into this broadcasting field, which you were so interested in since kindergarten? <laughs> I knew I wanted to do it. Uh, you talk about um, influences. Um, growing up in Jacksonville in the mid to late 1980s, the station was powered I-5, uh, which you know, was incredibly popular. You know, they had at one point, I think, a 22 share of the listening audience, which no radio station has had since. 
And so I remember listening to that station a lot. I thinking, you know, wow, that would be really cool to be on the radio. The funny thing is, I worked at a few stations in Jacksonville, never worked for WAPD, ironically enough. But uh, there was that. Uh, there were some years living in Los Angeles. I was influenced big time by a radio station called Pirate Radio. There's actually a tribute website to that station, the Pirate Radio out of Los Angeles. Scott Shannon was the morning guy and program director, very influential person in radio, uh, and really somebody who I have deep admiration for. So there were these influences. And what happened, Mike, was this. I took, you know, uh, some jobs that in the very beginning didn't have much to do with broadcasting, but just something to like pay the bills. 1992, this friend of mine at the time was going to Jacksonville University. And he tells me, look, the JU radio station, WFIN AM 650, had a radio signal that basically barely reached the parking lot of JU. Uh, but it was something in which he was like, look, if you want to do this, you can come on with me. I'm a student and we can do a show together. Well, I was like, okay, sign me up. You know, how quickly can you know, I get over there? And so I did that for a while. And it was funny because I never went to JU either. Never went to Jacksonville University, but was able to talk my way into getting on the radio. Was able to talk my way into getting an internship uh, in 1992 with what was then Paxton Communications, uh, which owned several radio stations in Jacksonville. Uh, including you were going to, then, yeah, go you were going to FCCJ at the time, right? Yeah, FCCJ by that time. And um, I was able to get in, in, you know, on over there at Paxton. And I remember this well. The first thing they had me do, first day there, was go through things they were going to put in the dumpster because they were so convinced that WQIK, which was their big rival of Rooster Country 107, they were convinced that WQIK was in their dumpster and trying to like get you know information on what Rooster Country 107 was doing. So like, that was my first responsibility as an intern. I'm thinking, okay, is this typical the broadcasting business shredding stuff? You know, but uh, that's where it began. Uh, you know, you talk your way into things. You try to lobby for things. I, I went around telling the program directors, like, you know, if you need anybody uh, help, like on weekends or overnights. And so start doing overnights, uh, weekends, 93.3 FM, which at that time was flat rock. Um, I remember a couple of my friends from high school, they happened to hear me on the radio. They're like, our car nearly went off the road. We're stunned that you're actually doing this. That led to three years over at the traffic center uh, doing traffic. Um, I commend those people who do it because – after a while, for me, it kind of seemed a bit repetitive, but there's people who have done it for a long time, and I admire them. Um, the connections I made with the traffic center led to me uh, eventually getting other radio opportunities, did weekend overnights at WQIK, uh, ironically. So I was over with the competition for a while. Uh, and then in 1995, finally landing at 102.9, where I spent the rest of my radio career. Did some more time at the traffic center, but... Uh, Last year at 102.9, nine years, multiple format changes, multiple owners, and somehow managed to hang on. You change, You mentioned the change of formats. You saw a lot of that in your career. You'd be doing some format, and then they'd go to another one. That happened a lot in radio, didn't it? Yes, exactly right. I mean, for example, you just look at the branding of 102.9. When I came there, it was Coast 102.9. And after a few weeks, they decided, okay, we're an adult contemporary station, but we're going to try to get a little older. So the next thing you know, it becomes Jacksonville Soft Rock, Coast 102.9. Then the following year, they decided to change it to Soft Rock 102.9. This was 1996, and we were taking on Light 96.1 head on, which, by the way, is was not a good idea. Um, you know, they already had a reputation in the market. You know, the the problem with 102.9, Mike, at that time was they were trying to be halfway in between where 96.1 was and where 95.1 was. And both those stations had a solid niche. And it's like, okay, we're the in-between thing. So they kept on tweaking it. Now, for a while, and this is one of those forgotten things in Jacksonville radio history, we were uh, making pot shots at light 96.1 on the air. And I remember when they had the idea to do this, I'm like, okay, let's think about the listeners here. If you're talking about making fun of the other radio station, this is not going to relate that well to your target demographic. But next thing I know, we're running these promos. Turn the light off. We were running promos. And by the way, uh, I want to emphasize I was not responsible for this. I apologize to Arthur in advance. 
uh, there were some that even like said, you know, it's like, why listen to a British morning show when you can listen to an all American morning show on 102.9? I mean, I'm just like, this is not going to work with your target audience of like, you know, upper end 25 to 54 females. And so they abandoned that approach. Turned it in 1997 to Mix 1038, so another rebranding. And then finally, uh, 2000, I'm doing like a different part time job, Mike. Uh, and someone calls me and says, Have you turned on your radio station lately? And I'm like, No, what's going on? So I turned it on in the office, and uh, they're doing this computerized countdown. And I immediately knew it's like, Okay, they're blowing it up again because when the countdown gets to zero, it's going to be something new. And I had no idea that this was going to be going down. Uh, but sure enough, it gets to zero. And I, round, along with everybody else in Jacksonville, found out, okay, this is the launch of 1029 The Point, which was all 1980s. And um, they were able, with me still around for the first several years of that, to make that all 80s format work for about nine years. Uh, so it was a very interesting ride um, in broadcasting. I mean, I'm obviously more media geek than someone who had like an incredibly long broadcasting career. But uh, it was a, you know, had some very interesting experiences during all that. Yeah. What was it like working in radio so many years and you're doing, you're right in the middle. You had to be happy though and, and really enjoying it being right in the middle of doing something that you'd always wanted to do. It was my childhood dream uh, to do this, to be on the radio and to be on the radio, Mike, in my hometown. Um, one of the most incredible experiences was going to my 10 year high school reunion. And you know, I thought, you know, look, maybe a couple of people might know what I do. And it said everybody, by this time I was on in mornings and I was like the only person on in mornings. 102.9 had a different programming philosophy. So it wasn't a full fledged morning show, but so many people were stopping me. It's like, we hear you. We can't believe you're doing this. And I'm just like, you know, it was, it was mind blowing. It was incredible. Um, we had a lot of fun. Um, I, I'm glad that I got to have that experience before the business changed, uh, because back then, although you did have duopolies, although you were starting to have some automation, it wasn't to the extent that you had now. You go back, you do a dance in time. For example, when I started on the radio my first time doing overnights in 93.3, just about all the FM radio stations had someone live and local on in overnights on weekends. And now, if you look at these radio stations, many of them, after 7 o'clock at night, on weeknights, they're computerized. Uh, forget about weekends. You know, it's like they're computerized, you know, just about all weekends. So it was an incredible experience. And I'm so glad that I got to do that at a time before the business radically changed. Mm -hmm. The music, uh, w w the broadcasting was what wanted you to do radio broadcasting was the broadcasting part of it. Was the music part of your interest as well? I mean, you learned a lot about music and all those changes that you went through, didn't you? Yeah. The funniest thing was this, you, you bring that up. It's like, because obviously, you know, one of the key things for any broadcaster, as you know, you know, you want to know what you're talking about. You want to do your homework where I felt that I had really succeeded. I got assigned to do the, uh, all request 70s Saturday night show on what was then Mix 103. And it was a five hour request show. Uh, it was, you know, very long, trying to edit all the calls in real time, you know, grueling. Some of these request shows are an hour and this was five hours. Well, what happened was um, there were these a uh, couple of local TV news anchors, uh, neither of whom work in the business now, but they were in Jacksonville both at that time. And they had called me up. And they were like, hey, we should hang out some time, you know, just get together for drinks or something. It's like, okay. And what was so funny, Mike, was when they met me, they're like, oh, my God, he's a baby. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? You know, it's like, did you expect that I was going to be like incredibly old or something? It's like, and they said to me, look, you know so much about the 70s doing this music and you talk about the 70s on your show that we thought you'd be much older. So I was like, OK, that's what you do. You do your homework. You know, you know your audience. You know, you try to relate to them, that kind of thing. So you're about looking at the number. You had a high school in ninety. When you're this is from you're from like nineteen years old to like thirty one is what your radio career was your age. Yeah, roughly, exactly. Um, I got to have some incredible experiences. Um, you know, you can relate to this. I think what I'm about to tell you here, Mike, your years in sports. I remember being on the radio the day after the AFC Championship game, uh, nineteen ninety seven you know, Jaguars versus Patriots, as it happened, we were fortunate enough 
at that time to have this weekly uh, call-in segment where we had Dave Wydell, uh, who was the center of the Jaguars, on with us. And it was funny because when I started doing mornings, you know, a few months beforehand, you know, this thing that we call the Wydell world of sports, it was a little bit, you know, comedic because we're trying to have some fun with him uh, because the Jaguars weren't winning a lot. You know, and Dave, you know, was a nice guy and was, you know, trying to be like, okay, we're going to try to find something nice to talk about. Then the team gets on a roll and it's like, we're right there with them. We're having fun, but now it ain't so much comedy. It's like, go Jags, you know? So that morning after the loss, and I didn't think he'd call in, but, you know, that's, that's being a man right there, taking the time to call in and talk about it. And that meant so much. And I was able to tell Dave, it's like, look, as a Jacksonville native, as someone who grew up in the city, and oh yeah, as someone who on my 21st birthday was the day that Jacksonville got the NFL team, you know, so yeah. there was so much deep resonance for me, and I was able to try to express just how grateful the whole city was to the Jaguars for what they were doing, and that meant so much. You started radio in 92. In 93, you told me you interned at Channel 17, WJKS TV. I was there as a maybe in sports then. Ken was there. Um, I, I really did sports. We were down the hall in the back and you were in the news part of it. You, you were interned in television, but you did not end up doing television. Uh, you stuck with radio. What, what, what was that about? What, why did that happen? Great question. Uh, you know, it's funny because when I was going to school, FCCJ, I had this professor, Ron Morso was his name, very interesting guy. And he would one, one day just asked everybody, what are your ambitions? What do you intend to do in this field? And some people said movies. A lot of people said television. Incidentally, I had a classmate there, uh, a woman named Mary, who later became the editor of the Times Union. You know, so that's a true story. Uh, she sit right next to me in class. But the thing of it is, is I was the only person who said radio. And more so is looking at me like, really? You realize that it's going to be all automated. You realize, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, Rod, they're always going to need somebody to say what time it is and what the temperature is. I was wrong. He wound up being right the way things went down. I mean, he was ahead of his time, but I'm glad that I got to follow my dreams. Now to pull that back to your question, you know, it's like, okay, so why didn't, you know, I go um, more into television. Here's the deal. There are some great people in that newsroom. Uh, as you know, you know, whether it was, you know, Terry Casey, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, yourself, obviously, Jeff Donald was our, you know, weeknight weatherman, you know, that kind of thing. So some good people, Jim Piggott, of course, who's, you know, covered just about everything. And um, getting to spend time with them, I was impressed by what they were doing, but I'm just like, my gosh, television news, so much of this, unfortunately, is, you know, crime and all, and not necessarily good news. So I'm like, you know, do I really want to do this? You know, I had this guy who I worked for, at 102.9, uh, I'll give him name credit, Brian Taylor. He said to me one day around 1998, several years later, said to me, it's like, John, I think you're interested in television and radio, but I think you're more interested, you know, in like programming, promotion, broadcast strategy. And I'm like, you hit it on the head. You know, that's it. I mean, I always had an interest in news, but it was more the media geek side of me. You know, so, you know, that's where I, that's what I ultimately figured out. Right. Let's go to the media geek thing. You, you know, the history of radio broadcasting and TV broadcasting in Jacksonville for what, maybe the last 40 to 50 years. You, you know, the, all the names of the broadcasters are on the air and when they were there, even more than, you know, more about 17 than I do. And I worked there for 20 and a half years and, and all that. Um, what led you to, to know all that and, and to learn all that? And why were you so interested in that? That's a great question. Um, Mike, bluntly, I think I didn't really have much of a life. I mean, <laughs> I talked about the kindergarten thing. Look, let me tell you, I'm, uh, you know, in going through, uh, you know, what was it here? Junior high school. I remember being in the basement of the Hayden Burns Library, looking through microfilms of the Times Union to try to find out about what the TV listings were back in the day. I guess I was just so fascinated by it's like, hey, you know, what are they doing in this medium, whether it's local television, local radio, you know, how are they making these decisions about what to put on? I'd spend hours upon hours just looking at like, you know, old clips of like TV ads and all, uh, you know, and I just found this, 
you know, incredibly interesting. There was one day I remember back in the late 90s. Uh, I was living in an apartment at Bay Meadows. I had these two guys who were friends of mine who both worked in TV news. One was a news anchor for actually Dave Hansen, who used to work at 17. Remember that name, Mike? Yeah, I remember him. You know, yeah. so Hansen's over there, and a guy, I don't know if you remember this other name, Keith Weiss. Yeah, I remember Keith. Yeah. yeah. And Keith's a news director now for the uh, NBC station in Johnson City, Tennessee. So they meet up there, like, because we were just going to be hanging out to just look at some of my collection of different VHS tapes of different TV news programs and all. They, they got there about 10 o'clock, six o'clock the following morning. We're still looking at stuff. Wow. I mean, it's like, you know, media geeks, what can I say? Uh, and I gave you a bunch of my VHS tapes you wanted to go through <laughs> to look at just even the commercials and the promos on the TV yeah. that, that in various years, you look at them just, they're, they're interesting how different they are and how they've changed and all that. It's like time travel, Mike, uh, <laughs> seeing this stuff, just seeing how different things looked back then, seeing what different programs were on back then. It's amazing how much, yeah, how society's changed and also the business has changed as well. Uh, it was such a different time. You know, you didn't really have reality television back then. You had news, you know, that was on maybe at noon, 6 and 11, and that was it. You didn't have the internet. I mean, it's amazing just in the course of our lives, not just in Jacksonville, but obviously, you know, in the country and around the world, just how much has changed over these past few decades. And so the oldest that I found, by the way, in all my efforts to find VHS tapes, and it's funny, I mentioned my girlfriend, Tammy, here. She was the one who in 2012, when I told her, it's like, look, I'd love to find more footage of stuff. And she's like, why don't you go to the Goodwill Pound Stores, John? Because they may have VHS tapes there. And I'm like, great idea. And um, since then, I've collected, Mike, it's like confession time for Catholic boy here. Uh, I collected, Mike, about maybe um, three or 4,000 tapes. Tammy really regrets that she suggested that. She really does. <laughs> oh, I'm Obviously, sure. Obviously, some of which, you know, it's like, you know, look, I mean, you, you know, you give them back to the folks and all that because we can't just keep 3,000, 4,000 tapes around here. But uh, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, the oldest I've gotten, some stuff from 1979 from Miami. And you look at everything and it's like, wow, this is the closest thing we can get to time travel. I mean, now, now many people have gone through Jacksonville broadcasting radio and TV and have gone on to bigger and better things. And you would know all of them. Just list me a couple or three or four that come to your mind right away. You think about Sam Champion and the amazing thing with Sam uh, was that he was hired as the weekend weatherman at Channel 17 in the spring of 1986. And a few months later, they decided to make a change in the weeknight weatherman position, but they didn't promote Sam. They brought in someone else instead, early 1987. And she's only there for a few months. Sharon Graves was only there for a little while before they decided to make another change. They wound up bringing in Kathy Turner, but passed over Sam again. Sam told this story uh, back around 2005 on Good Morning America, where uh, they had basically had each of the GMA personalities talk about the most significant year in their lives. And for Sam, that was 1988, because as he said, he's a, week, a weekend weatherman at WJKS in Jacksonville. He gets this call from an agent who says, look, don't go anywhere. Don't sign any other contract. I've got your next job lined up for you. Boom. It's WABC New York. So he goes from, you know, what was then, I think, market 62 to the number one market. I mean, I mentioned that story to other people because it's not just a fascinating broadcasting story, but it shows that the business can be very subjective. You know, sometimes you have some, someone who sees something in a talent or in a broadcaster that someone else missed. And obviously, Sam's career speaks for itself. Right. Uh, you look at people like, you know, John Nicholson, of course, is a great anchor at 17. And. Unfortunately, he didn't get the weeknight gig, uh, but still spent many years in the business in Syracuse, New York after that. You know, you look at someone, you've interviewed Marshall Ladenborn. Uh, that was an incredible get for Channel 12 to bring in the former CNN primetime anchor. I remember in 1986, I'm watching TV and I see Channel 12's got this new look, new set, new anchors. And I'm like, how in the heck did they get her from CNN? That was a major coup. So you have, obviously, Tom Wills and his legendary career, how much he's seen. We've had some excellent broadcasters, you know, as you say. Winterling, of course, legend. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, about other people. I'll give you another example of one. 
Bruce Hamilton, uh, who, you know, it's amazing how time has flown. He's now been in Jacksonville for 23 years, previously in Tucson and Orlando and Philadelphia. Shortly after Bruce came to town, he was working with us on the radio for a while. And he was telling us a story about a co-anchor who he worked with in Philadelphia, but he couldn't remember her name. And I said, oh, you mean Jennifer Ward? And Bruce slowly turns to me and says, John, how is this in knowledge going to help you in any way? And it's like, well, you know, it's like, I enjoy it. I just find it incredibly interesting. Right. Well, let me mention that in 1976, I started at Channel 17, and I would go cover news conferences with a sheriff. And alongside me, my colleague from Channel 4 was Steve Croft. Wow. There you go. <laughs> and okay. see, look, you're still doing what you're doing. You know, it's like Croft. I mean, he's, you know, it's like, he just, he just couldn't stay here anymore, Mike. That's one way to look at it. But, yeah, but you know, and uh, he had a great career. Six, of course, he recently retired and I, they had a segment on him there. So that, that was, uh, that was pretty good. Oh, wait a minute, Mike. I got one for you here because, you know, obviously beside DCF, you know, my girlfriend and I fast Jack's trivia. We do trivia shows in Jacksonville. I'm going to try to stump you. There's someone who covers the NFL on national television, studio show, who used to be a weekend sportscaster in Jacksonville for one year. Who am I talking about? He's the Fox studio host. The Fox guy on Fox. I can't remember his name. What is, uh, uh, you help me. Go ahead. I know when you'll say it. Kurt Menefee. Menefee, yes. He yeah. Was, yeah. He was here for like a he cup of here. coffee, like a year. You know, so you had Dan Hicken uh, when Dan got promoted to the main gig in 1991. And they bring in Kurt, and I think he had some experience doing sports at like a cable startup that was trying to compete with ESPN but was ahead of their time. So he was available. 12 picks him up. You know, only here a year before going on to Dallas. And then, of course, you know, the rest of his career and a great talent. You know, you look at the, uh, the history of television and radio in the Jacksonville market. It's amazing how many talented people and how many great stories there are. Um, what advice would you give to young people that want to get into broadcasting now? What advice would you give to them? Three words. I think you start with following your heart first. You know, there is a guy who used to work for uh, Clear Channel uh, who uh, ran the operation, who made the point that you should only get into broadcasting. He said, uh, one, if you're really passionate about it, and two, if you feel like there's nothing else you can do. Well, that's one way to look at it, but here's the deal. You have to understand, you know, uh, Scott Shannon, you know, who I mentioned is like kind of like my idol in broadcasting. He brought up the point that it's about paying the price. It's like, okay, there's so many people that want to do this. One, do you love it? Two, are you willing to pay the price to succeed at your craft? You know, how much do you want to do this? And if you feel that it's like, okay, this is something that I really want to do. I want to have this adventure. I want to have this experience, as Marshall Lanedorf had said to us when we were at UNF, you know, uh, years later, because I eventually went there after FCCJ. It's like, look, you're going to get to meet so many interesting people, for example, doing news. You're going to get to go to so many interesting places. If you feel that all of those things basically are important to you, go do it. Because here's the deal. You may work in broadcasting for quite a while, and not necessarily make that much money, or it may take you a while to advance, but it's going to be easier to follow those dreams when you're younger than when you're older and you have more responsibilities. Uh, there's a story I've heard about a high ranking executive uh, at Disney who was at ABC for many years. And it's something where uh, he, back in the, I think, mid to late 90s, had confided to one of ESPN's on ear talent it's like, look, I still have this dream sometimes in the back of my head of wanting to be on air, a regular on air talent. The problem was, as he said, I'd have to take a 90% pay cut. I'd have to go to some smaller market. I'd have to give, give up the life that I have in order to pursue that dream. As high as he got in life, that was an unrecognized dream. If you were young, if you were passionate, if you, you know, care about this sort of thing, radio, television, do it. Go after it. Know that, you know, there's a price to pay as far as the work involved, the sacrifices, and being flexible to possibly move to other markets, uh, maybe take on shifts other people would have taken on. But uh, if you believe in it, go. How important is broadcasting in this community in Jacksonville to you? How important is it? It keeps us connected, Mike. I mean, I think that the work that people do, whether it's in journalism, you know, as far as being a watchdog, you know, for the community, 
uh, as far as the important reporting, for example, you know, things like, you know, JEA. Now, I have to give the Times Union credit, you know, again, my old classmate, Mary, and, you know, what, uh, you know, Nate Monroe has done uh, and his team there at the Times Union, but also some good broadcast reporting, too. I'd single out, for example, the work of Vic Michelucci recently over at News 4 Jax. He was able to do some outstanding perspective. You know, when they open up the beaches in Duval County, and there are so many reports, it's like, oh, people are, you know, crowded on the beaches. It's overrun in Jacksonville. And Vic dug deeper, and he looked into it and said, look, a lot of this may not be what it seems. And he pointed this out on air, and he pointed this out online. One of the great things about working where I work at DCF is, for the most part, uh, I work with some outstanding people who are very committed to accuracy as reporters, who want to get the story right. They do their very best. It's challenging. You have a lot of news time to fill, and so many reporters have multiple stories they have to cover even in a day. But uh, there have been so many outstanding folks who I've worked with, and I deeply admire the skills that they bring to the table. And I want to point out, Radio has an important part, too. Yes, you have some radio news over at 104.5 and 89.9. But beyond that, you talk about the local on-air personalities and the connection to the community. Uh, to single out a few, I mean, I think Arthur Crofton has had a legendary career. He was never affected. His career was never affected by the shots that 102.9 took at him. Not my idea back <laughs> in the day. Uh, you know, incredible run at 96.1 in mornings, and he dates back to the late 70s. Uh, you look at people like the morning team over at 99.9 with Steve and Eden and Amadeus and what they've been able to do. They're bringing that station very close to WQIK as far as the ratings. And that's a hard thing to do because QIK with John Scott, Robbie Rose, you know, really a legend in this town, but they've been able to do some good things at 99.9. Uh, there's some excellent people who they came to Jacksonville and as Sam Kuvar said, you know, look, they come here. They really like it here, and they're like, you know, look, I think I want to have a life here. I want to raise a family here, but they're also devoted to broadcasting and serving the community as well, and that's so wonderful to see. John, I think our time is about up. We could do an hour and a half on your geekdom and all the things about that, but it's been a pleasure having you on. And, you know, usually at the end of these, I reach out and shake your hand and thank you for being, we can't do that. It's virtual, which is what it's been for quite a while, but it's just been a pleasure talking to you. And it's amazing what you know. <laughs> it's an honor, Mike. Thank you so much for having me. I salute you <laughs> from a distance, obviously, about 200 miles away on the internet connection. But uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you.